You're watching a channel 98 NBISD TV production. How you doing there? Welcome to uh, Deja Vu. It's Algebra 2. I'm your host, Kevin Corpy, and I'm just reading an email from, uh, from an actual viewer out there. Uh, thanks for sending it in. Let me, let me share it with you. It says, Mr. Corpy, love the show. Love the show. I actually wrote it twice. Thank you. Um, this viewer wants to know when we're actually going to be using the graphing calculator on the program. She has a brand new TI-83+, Plus, and she's eager to use it but she just doesn't really know how to use it appropriately. Well, as it turns out, we're actually going to be using the graphing calculator on today's show. So why don't you go grab yours if you have it, download the worksheets from the district website, www.newbronfels.txed.net, and join me for another fascinating mathematical episode of Deja Vu, it's Algebra 2. All right, lesson four already. It seems like only a week ago we were on lesson three. Man, how time flies the way you expect it to. Okay, linear functions, graphing and writing equations. Uh, last week we looked specifically at solving linear equations of the form ax plus b. Well, this week we're going to look at linear functions of a single variable, functions rather than just equations. So remember that a function is of the form y equals f of x. This is function notation. And a function is a special relation that maps an element of a set called the domain, the input, the independent variable, that's our x, to a single value, no more than one value in another set called the range. That's our y values, or our function values. Now we typically represent functions by an equation. And a common way to write a linear function is in the slope-intercept form, something that you're probably very familiar with from Algebra 1. So here's slope-intercept form. We have y, which now I'm going to be using exclusively f of x, is m times x plus b. Now that just looks like a whole bunch of letters, and that's because it is. This is a literal equation. But when we look at equations, we're going to have specific values plugged in for m and b. They have very specific meaning. And here's what they are. f is the name of the function. So we are going to be looking at functions that are maybe g of x or h of x. So f, in this case, is the name. x is our independent variable. And that's one of the beauties of function notation. We can see the independent variable there. f of x, the whole thing, is our dependent variable. It's the y value on the graph. Okay, so we can use those interchangeably. M is very important. M is actually the slope of our line. And uh, there's been a lot of debate as to why the letter M. One theory is it's from the French verb monter, which is to climb. Um, but that's been kind of discredited. So just get used to the letter M for slope. And then we have B. B is our constant. M is the coefficient of x. The constant, B, represents something very important on the graph of the line. It is the y-intercept, or the point at which the graph crosses the y-axis. So m is the slope, it's the coefficient of x, and the constant b is the y-intercept. Let's look at a linear functions equation, and we're going to look at it in combination with its numerical equivalent and its graphical equivalent, because we want to try and represent things this year symbolically through the equation, numerically through a table of values, and graphically, because they're all same representations of the same equation. All right, here's a linear equation. f of x is 4x plus 1. 4, remember, is the coefficient of x, and it's in slope-intercept form, so 4 is the slope, and 1 is the y-intercept. That's where it crosses the x-axis. What we want to do is we want to sketch a graph. So the easiest way to sketch a graph that's in slope-intercept form is to draw yourself a little coordinate plane, your x and y-axis, and start with the y-intercept. It's your uh, starting point. And so I'm going to go up one on the y-axis and create a point. And I just need one other point for the equation of a line, and the slope gives it to me. The slope is really a ratio of the rise in the graph, how fast it's rising vertically, with respect to the run, how fast it's moving horizontally. So this graph is increasing vertically four times faster than it's moving horizontally. So I can get another point by going up four, one, two, three, four, and over one, which puts me here. Or I could also go down four, one, two, three, four, and left one. And I only needed the two points, and now with the straight a line as I can, 
I will draw a line through the points, and I'll put arrows on the end, denoting that the line goes on to infinity in both directions. Now, that's a pretty nice sketch by hand. Uh, you're just showing the critical information, the y-intercept, and then the direction that it's going. And the slope is 4, and the y-intercept is 1. Let's look at the uh, numeric equivalent of this. And I got this from the TI-83 calculator, which I'm going to be showing you how to use here in just a second. I pulled the data screen off there. These, this is a table of values. These are integer values of x, and these are the function values for each of these. For instance, when I look at 1 right here, f of 1 is 4 times 1 is 4, plus 1 is 5. If I plug in a 2, 4 times 2 is 8, plus 1 is 9. So this is a numeric equivalent to the graph and the equation itself. Now here's something very important about lines if you have the set of data. You can tell it's linear. Sometimes data doesn't reveal itself as nicely as as the graph or the equation. If you're increasing your x's by 1 each time, by a nice integer value of 1, you should have a common difference in your y values. And let's see what the common difference is here. From 0 to 1, that's a change in plus 1 on my x. And from 1 to 5 is a change of 4. Over here, from 1 to 2 again, a change in 1. From 5 to 9 is a change in 4. From 2 to 3 is plus 1. And from 9 to 13 is plus 4. So notice right here, I have a common difference of 4 from one y value to the next. Well, if you take the common difference of y's over the common difference of x, guess what you get? 4 over 1, which is, ta-da, the slope or the rate of increase of the graph with respect to the horizontal change. Now, here's how we can do this on the graphing calculator. All right, I have a TI-83 Plus right here, and I have a little cursor that it's going to take the place of my ugly finger so it doesn't get in the way. So the first step for any calculation operation is to turn it on. The on button's down here. Now once we turn it on, we can go to our y equals. It's found in the top left. And to put anything into our calculator, it has to be solved for y. Slope intercept form is a good way to do that. So I can just type in 4x plus 1. 4, our x variable button is this right here, x t theta n. We'll hit x, and down here plus 1. And then we can graph it. You have a graphing button up here, but I always like to hit the zoom and go to zoom 6, which will graph it in a standard viewing window. Or you can hit a zoom 5, which is a square viewing window. And notice that this pretty much looks similar to what I did by hand. We can verify what the y value is for any value of x by hitting this trace button right here. And then we can use our little cursors, and we can scroll left and right as often as we want. And we get these sets of ordered pairs down at the bo bottom that are actually uh, points on the line. They make the equation true. But you can also plug in at any time any x value you want if you hit the trace button. Let's plug in an x equals 0 and hit enter. And notice it shows us a y value of 1. So this is nice because it gives you the numeric down here, the point 0, 1, which is the y-intercept. And you have this graphical representation of it right here, which is the y-intercept. And also notice up here it can give you what the actual equation is, which is pretty nice. To get to the table that I was showing you earlier, you can set up your table under your window. Um, and you can set it up so that it starts at 0. And we're counting by delta table, which is 1. Now to actually get to your table, we go to the second function on the graph. So we hit this yellow second button, come over to the graph, and we'll see that the, uh, whoops, try that again. Right here. There's the table of values. It'll automatically generate these x's in any increment we want. And notice it says y sub 1 here. That's the equation we have in y1. And here are the corresponding y values. So learning how to use the calculator is going to be pretty important throughout the year. Now there is a close connection between solving linear equations, in this case 4x plus 1 equals 0, like we did last time on the show, and finding the x-intercepts of the graph of y equals, or f of x equals 4x plus 1. And in fact, it's exactly the same procedure. And this is because we're essentially finding the value of x that yields a y value of 0 when we actually plug it in. And here's a good question. Where are all the points in the coordinate plane with y values of 0? Hmm, on the x-axis. Any point on the x-axis, whether it's 3, 0, negative 5, 0, negative 2, 0, 0, 0, all the y values are 0 on the x-axis. So another name, in fact, for the x-axis is the horizontal line y equals 0. That's another alias of the x-axis. So what we're going to do now is we're going to actually find the zeros or the x-intercepts of the graph two different ways. We're going to find them algebraically, which is pretty much the same calculation we did last time. And we're going to find them graphically. And we're going to do it for our same function, f of x plus 1. So if we're going to solve, find the zeros 
um, algebraically, the first thing you have to do is set your function 4x plus 1. You have to set it equal to 0. Why 0? Because when y is 0, we are on the x-axis. And that's what we want. Now I've created a linear equation, and I can solve that just like we did on the last episode. I'll subtract 1 from both sides, and then I'll divide both sides by 4, and I get x equals negative 1 fourth. That is the x-intercept. If you want to write it as a coordinate or an ordered pair, it would be negative 1 fourth, comma, 0, because that's where it lives. Now, how do we do it graphically? We're going to go back to the graphing calculator, and I'll show you how to do that. All right, remember, we still have our function 4x plus 1 in y1. If we go back to the graph, there it is. I want to find out where it crosses the um, x-axis. Now, notice it looks like it crosses at the origin, but that could be misleading. If we want, we can actually change our window and hit a zoom uh, decimal is a nice one to use, too. And that assigns integer values to each pixel on the calculator. And now we can kind of see it's basically zooming in that it doesn't cross at the origin. If we happen to know what the x-intercept is, we can verify it by hitting the trace button. And we found it to be negative 1 fourth. I could punch in negative, which is right down here. It's different from the minus sign. Negative 1 divided by 4. Hit Enter. And it'll tell you that the y value is 0. So again, we got a numeric confirmation. And we have a visual that it's the x-intercept. Now, what if we didn't know what it was? There's a way to find it on the calculator. Once you're in graph mode, you can go to the second command of your trace, which is your calculate screen. And if you go to the calculate screen, you get all these nice choices. You have zero, value, minimum, maximum, intersect, and some calculus commands. We want to find the zero. So I'm going to hit number two. I can click two, or I can actually type in a two down here. And it's going to ask us for some information. It'll ask you for the left bound. Well, we always read a graph from left to right. So I need to be to the left of where the x-intercept is, which is below it in this case. And I'll hit Enter when I know I'm below. I've got a visual here with my cursor. I've got a y value of negative 0.6. And I'll hit Enter. And then the right bound, I'll click to the right and tell them across. I've got a visual cue. It's blinking. And I've got a, a numeric cue of 0.6 is positive. Hit Enter. And then for your guess, you could just click back once or twice until you think you're on the point where it crosses the x-axis. And then you hit Enter. And your calculator will actually scan, and it looks for a sign change. And it gives us negative 0.25, which is the decimal equivalent of negative 1 fourth. And it confirms it with a 0 there. So finding zeros, finding roots on the calculator can be done from the graphing screen with your second trace, number 2 command. And we'll get real comfortable with that throughout the year. Now, what if our function is not in slope-intercept form? How do we graph it then? Well, our calculator, remember, requires it to be in slope-intercept form to, to work with it. So let's look at this function right here. It's an equation. It has an x and a y, and it's equal to 0. This is actually called the general form of a line. But we know it's linear because there's an x to the first power. So let's go ahead and get it in slope-intercept form. To do that, we want to isolate the y term. So I get negative 15y equals, I'm going to bring the 5x across and put it first, because that's getting closer to the slope-intercept form. And then I'll bring the 30 across, and it becomes positive. Then I'm going to divide everything through by the coefficient of y, which is negative 15. And we get negative 5 negative 15 x plus 30 over negative 15. And then I'll simplify. A negative divided by negative is positive, And 5 15 is 1 third x plus, which is really a minus, minus 2. So there it is in slope-intercept form. So now I can graph it. I can go down two units down here, and that's my y-intercept. The slope is 1 third, so it's, it's not rising as quickly. It's going up 1 for every 3. It's moving to the right. But that's enough to get me another point. Up 1, 1, 2, 3 to the right. Puts me right here at 3, negative 1. And I can connect the dots. And there you have it. And if you wanted to put it on the calculator, uh, you would just enter this in y1. And you would type it in 1 divided by 3. Hit the x button, minus 2. And then you can hit zoom 6. All right. So. The fact that it's not a slope-intercept form, not a real big deal. Uh, what if we wanted to find the zero of this? Notice it's way out here somewhere. Well, how would I do that, remember? I can set my equation, 1 third x minus 2, the function equal to 0, and solve. So I'd get 1 third x equals 2. Multiply both sides by 3, and you get x equals 6. Is that reasonable, that it crosses the x-axis at the point 6, 0? Well, let's see. 1, 2, 3. 4, 5, 6. Yeah, my graph is not dead on, but all the graph is good for, really, is to give you an approximation of what's really going on. 
If you want to go to the calculator, you can do the same thing. All right, let's take a quick break. Don't go away. Watch these public service announcements and come right back. And something to ponder while you're gone. Why was the student afraid of the Y-intercept? My cell phone number. The odds of a babysitter calling 911, one in 1,400. The odds of a child being diagnosed with autism, one in 150. To learn the signs of autism, go to autismspeaks.org. Welcome back to Deja Vu. It's Algebra 2. I'm still Kevin Corpy. Uh, did you think about that question? Why was the student afraid of the Y intercept? Well, it is, of course, because she was afraid of the B. Right, back to math. So we've got an equation. We know how to graph it. We can also write our own equations. We can produce equations. And we need to be given some information, of course. So let's, let's look at some different information uh, that we can use to write equations of lines. The first case would be given a slope m and a point x sub 1, y sub 1, that is not the y-intercept. Remember, if it was the y-intercept, we'd have our b, and we can just drop it into the equation. Well, in this case, we can use a special form of the equation that is specifically suited for a point and the slope. It's called the point-slope formula, quite appropriately named. And you might remember it from Algebra 1. It's a modified version of the equation for finding slope. It's the change in the y's. y is our variable that remains. Minus y sub 1 is our point. Equals m, the slope, times the quantity x minus x sub 1. x sub 1 is the x value that we're given. So this x and this y are the two variables that remain in the equation. So let's go ahead and see if we can write an equation for a line that has a slope of negative 3 fifths that passes through the point negative 4 thirds. Well, we can label this. This is going to be our m. And negative 4 is our x sub 1, and 3 is our y sub 1. Labeling it tends to help. Now we'll go to the equation. y minus y sub 1. Be careful here. x is the first coordinate in the ordered pair, but it's not the one that we write with the y. And I see some students just uh, making the mistake of writing down the first number. Um, You've got to go over to the y and pick it up. So it's y minus 3 equals m negative 3 fifths times x minus negative 4. We're subtracting a negative, so this is a negative number. We still have to subtract it, which actually turns it into addition. This technically is an equation of a line. It's not very useful, though, because our calculator can't accept it. And although we do know the slope, we don't really know the y-intercept. So let's go ahead and do a little bit of extended algebra here and get it in the slope-intercept form. I'll distribute negative 3 fifths x. That's really now a plus 4, so I get minus 12 fifths. And now if I just add 3 to both sides, I get negative 3 fifths x minus 12 fifths plus 3. But 3, I need to get in terms of 5, so it's really 15 fifths. 3 is 15 fifths, which puts it as a common denominator. So I'm going to come over here and write my final equation, y equals negative 3 fifths x. And 15 fifths minus 12 fifths is positive 3 fifths. And there you go. That's the equation in slope-intercept form. Notice we have a negative slope. That means that the slope is decreasing. Um, let's go ahead and see what that looks like on the calculator. Go back to y equals and clear out this. A negative 3 fifths, here's the negative sign, 3 divided by 5, x plus 3 divided by 5. And then I'll hit a zoom. I'm going to do zoom 5 this time. Zoom 5 is a square window, and what it does is it puts each increment on the x and y axis uniform. Uh, the standard actually stretches out the x axis a little bit. And so we get this graph. And notice because it's a negative slope, it's falling from left to right or it's decreasing. For every horizontal movement of 5, we're going down 3 units. Or for every uh, movement left 5 units, we're going up 3 units. Okay, so this falls from left to right. And again, we can hit the trace button and punch in a 0 and hit enter. And we see that our y-intercept is 0 0.6. 0 0.6 is the decimal equivalent of 3 fifths. So we've got it. All right. Let's look at another version to write that line. Remember I talked about the general form? General form is appropriate sometimes to write our equations when we have fractions like this. And it might show up on a multiple choice question when uh, there's fractions like this. So we can actually get rid of the fractions by multiplying all the way through by the least common multiple of all the denominators, which is 5 and 5. So it's going to be 5. So it's an equation. So if I multiply this side by 5, I'm introducing it, which is fine so long as I do it on the other side. So now I get 5y equals, and if I carefully distribute, the 5s will divide out, leaving me negative 3x plus 3. And so you can actually go backwards by dividing everything through by 5 and verify that you get the same answer. 
And now we'll group everything. I don't like negative leading terms, so I'm going to bring the 3 over to this side and make it positive. Then the general form, the y comes next. And then bringing the 3 across, it becomes negative 3, and it's equal to 0. So this, again, is what we call the general form. And it is a line. Again, it's not as useful as the slope-intercept form. Um, had we chosen to collect all of our variables on the right-hand side, we would have ended up with a negative 3x. Bringing the 5 across makes it, ne it negative, and the 3 is still positive, and it's still equal to 0. And these are actually equivalent. So if you don't see your answer on a multiple choice, and they're all written like this, don't panic. This is equivalent. We just multiplied everything through by a negative 1. Okay, so the general form. Another way that we can write equations of the line is when we're given two points. And basically, if we're given two points, we're going to use the same formula, the point-slope formula. We're just going to have one calculation off to the side, and that is to find the slope. Otherwise, the formula for it, the point-point formula, gets too complicated. So here's my two points. I can find the slope first. I want to write an equation of a line that passes through there. So it's the change in y's. So 1 minus negative 5. I like to draw the arrows. And again, I'm subtracting a negative, so that's important. Um, over the change in the corresponding x's, 4 minus negative 3. And so that gives me 6 sevenths. There's the slope. All right. Um, now I get to choose either of the two points. The line has to pass through both of them. Most people would probably opt for the 4 comma 1 because people are kind of naturally tentative of negative numbers. And you remember the history of mathematics, people stayed away from it forever. So if you're afraid of negatives, I don't blame you. But I'm going to face my fears, and I'm going to use the negative numbers. So here we go, using the point-slope formula. y minus the y value, negative 5, equals m, the slope, 6 sevenths, times x minus uh, negative 3. And then we'll simplify. That's y plus 5 equals 6 sevenths x plus, this is going to be actually now plus 3, and I get 18 sevenths when I multiply. And if I subtract 5, I get 6 sevenths x plus 18 sevenths minus 5. And if we look at that, how many sevenths is 5? Well, if I multiply by 7 over 7, I get 18 sevenths minus 35 sevenths. And that gives me a nice answer of 17 sevenths. And so bringing all this down, I should do this all the way down. It's plus, it's y, and then finally we get down to here. So fractions require just a little bit more work because we have to get common denominators. And notice I'm staying away from the calculator for all this because it's forcing me to use my brain and develop number sense and mental agility. You can go to the calculator and punch in 17 sevenths and get the decimal equivalent, but it's not much fun to do that. Now it's time for that favorite part of the program called Deja Review. For the Deja Review segment today, we're going to go on a little fantasy trip here. We're going to take a road trip. We're going to need to rent a car, but we're not going to rent a car. We're going to the, uh, the I Love Math Auto Rentals. Yeah, it's a made-up business, right? But it's our trip. We could do it however we want. Now, we are going to actually rent a convertible RV. Doesn't that sound cool? Made up company, made up automobile, not a big deal. But here's what we're doing. They're going to quote us a rate on what it's going to cost to rent this convertible RV. And here's what they quoted us. They said that there's a one-time fee of 220 real dollars plus an ongoing cost of 15 cents. That's dollar sign point one five uh, cents per mile. What we want to do is we want to write an equation for the total cost C to rent the fun machine on wheels, which is what I'm calling that, as a function n, the number of miles that we've driven. And once we do that, we want to answer some questions. Well, let's think about it. If we kind of draw a little first quadrant diagram here, which is going to give us our relevant domain, and it's a relevant domain because the line has a domain of all real numbers. But in the real world, since we're talking about n, which is the number of miles we're driving, we don't want to look at negative number of miles. And if we're talking about cost in dollars, we don't want to have negative dollars. So most real life applications are going to be dealing in a relevant domain, in this case, the first quadrant. What's the cost if I rent the car, but I don't drive anywhere? It's my prerogative. I can rent the fun machine and stay in the parking lot. Since it's an RV, that might be OK. Well, it's going to be $220. That's the one-time fee that it's going to cost me. So when n equals 0, which is right here on the y-axis, it's going to cost me $220. I can't get around uh, having to pay that. Now, as soon as I start driving, 
One mile, it's going to cost me 15 cents. So my price goes up 15 cents for one mile that I've driven. So there's my new price. I drive another mile. The cost goes up 15 cents for every mile that I've driven. Notice that I'm going up by $0.15, and I'm going right by one mile. And I've created these points along this line. Well, guess what the slope of this line is? It's going to be M, of course, and it's $0.15, or 15 cents, per one mile. Or just as a rate, the rate they quoted me, 15 cents per mile. So the slope in the context of an application is not just the rise over the run. It's the rate of change of my cost with respect to the number of miles driven, or in this case, the specific rate per mile that they charged me. So now that I know that this is my slope, my y-intercept was 220, I can write my function. And I'm not going to use y and x. I'm going to use c as a function of n. The cost as a function of the number of miles driven is um, 0.15, 0 0.15, and I'm not going to put the dollar sign anymore because it's an equation, times n instead of x, the number of miles driven, plus 220, which is my initial cost. This is what math is all about. We learn how to do this stuff in, a, in an isolated case do, through examples, but this is where the rubber hits the road, literally, right? This is where it all comes together, writing a mathematical model that we can now use to predict things. So let's go ahead and predict what our cost is going to be if we actually drive 1,500 miles. Well, we could do that two ways. We can actually plug in a 1,500 for n, and that's what the function notation allows us to do. And it'll be 0.15 times 1,500 plus $220. And I can go directly to the calculator to do that, and I'll show you that right now. From the home screen, click on, and to get to the home screen, you have to quit the graph, so you hit second mode, which is your quit, and we call this the home screen. I can punch it in, 0 0.15 times 1500, 1500, plus 220. And I'll hit enter, which is the equal button, and I get 445. So it's going to cost us $445. And that's not including gas or uh, chips and sodas and all the fun math supplies we're going to bring with us. Now we can also do this graphically. Let's go to the y equals button. Um, we're going to type in our equation. It was uh, 0.15. And I've got to use x, even though I called it n in my application. The calculator knows nothing but x plus 220. And now I'm going to go to my window, not zoom. I'm going to manually type in what my x min and x max are. My x min, that's the number of miles driven. I'm going to put it at 0. The maximum number of miles I'm driving, we drove 1,500. So I'm going to go up to about 2,000 in case we want to see the graph beyond that. And the next one is your x scale. I'm going to put it at 0. That's how often you want to tick mark. And then I'll go to y min. That's the cost, remember. Um, I'm going to put that at 0. And the maximum cost, well, we already know that uh, it was going to be um, 400 something dollars. So I'm going to go up here to maybe 500 and again, turn this to zero, and then I can hit graph. And I have manually put in my X and Y windows. Now again, if you hit the trace button, you can cruise left and right with your cursor, and this is nice information now. The ordered pair down here gives you the number of miles you're driving and the total cost it's going to give you. And you have a lot of what-if scenarios right here. So we wanted to drive 1,500 miles. I could type in 1500, hit enter, and boom, there it is. I have $445, and I know exactly where it is on the grand scheme of the total cost per mile driven. Nice calculator. All right, huge show today. Solving linear equations, graphing lines on the calculator, a lot of keystrokes, a lot of commands that you need to get comfortable with. And how do you do that? You just work a lot of problems. So it all comes down to practice, practice, practice. I encourage you to practice diligently, and if you have any questions on commands for the calculator, or how to actually solve equations, please send me an email. You can find my email address on the district's website. Until next time, I'm Kevin Corpy for Deja Vu with Algebra 2, and I'm reminding you to do your homework.